Hello, and welcome to the 15th of this series of programmes about foundational concepts in economics. This one looks at the idea of rational choice. Uh, this is a concept which is very important for economists. In fact, it's fair to say that it's one of the central concepts for most contemporary economic analysis. It's also important for a number of other disciplines, in particular sociology and also philosophy, uh, but we won't deal with the way that those disciplines make use of the concept here. Basically, what most economists will argue and assert is that most human beings are rational choosers. And it's on the basis of saying that, that we can make all kinds of predictions about how they will behave and understand the way that they have behaved in the past. This is a very controversial statement. And the whole idea of rational choice is a very controversial one for scholars of all kinds. Many people, uh, some economists, but lots of non-economists are deeply skeptical of the idea of rational choice. And it's been subject to all kinds of criticism from a whole range of quarters. The arguments typically being that human beings are actually not in any meaningful sense rational choosers or perhaps that there are certain kinds of outcomes that you simply can't explain using rational choice uh, arguments. It is worth also saying, however, that the concept of rational choice that economists use is widely misunderstood. And a lot of the criticisms that are levied against this concept are actually what are called straw man arguments. In other words, they are attacking a kind of caricature of rational choice that no economist actually believes, rather than the real thing that they do believe. Before we move on, it's worth saying that what rational choice is, is a theory of action. It's a theory, therefore, that tries to explain why it is and how it is that human beings make choices between different courses of action and therefore uh, make the choices that they do and act in the ways that they do. It is not the only such theory out there. There are a whole range of other ones. Uh, for example, classical Christian thinking uh, thinks that the basis on which human beings act is the constant weakness of the human will brought about by the fall of man and that therefore human beings are both uh, torn between one tendency to do good and another very powerful tendency to do bad uh, and that that is what explains the actions human beings make. That's another theory of human action. So what is the uh, theory of rational choice? Well first of all let's be clear about what it doesn't mean. Uh, to say that human beings are rational choosers does not mean first of all that people are basically selfish bastards. It does not mean that human beings are egoistic creatures who constantly look to maximize their own personal self-interest. There are some people who think that that is what human beings are, uh, descriptive egoists as they call, who think that that's a fair description of the way human beings actually are. But that's not what economists mean when they use the concept of rational choice. They're not saying that we are all people who care only for ourselves and don't care about anybody else. Nor are they saying that human beings are like robots or like the mythical Vulcans of the Star Trek television series like Dr. Spock. In other words, human beings are not desiccated calculating machines who think things up in a completely dispassionate, uh, logical way. That is also not what is meant by rational choice. Rational choice is actually a very thin or minimal idea of rationality. It means only a very short list of things uh, which, as I say, amount to an extremely thin, very attenuated notion of rationality. First of all, it means that people prefer to have more of what they like and less of what they don't like. In other words, it would not be rational if you don't like something to deliberately go and get more of it. Uh, conversely, if you do like something, it is rational up to a point to act so as to get more of it. Therefore, rational action is action which increases the amount of things that you do like and diminishes the amount of things that you don't like. Therefore, rational action maximizes utility. Now, it's important to emphasize here that utility does not necessarily mean material well-being. It can mean anything because utility is purely subjective. 
uh, each person has their own utility function, as it's called, their own ranking of different things. What it's simply saying, the theory of rational choice, is that people will act in a way that makes them better off subjectively by getting more of what they like, less of what they don't like. Now, what the second point is that uh, rational action means that you learn from experience. In other words, if you do something and you find that it results in bad uh, consequences for you, it results in more of what you don't like, then you will tend not to do that again in the future. If you put your hand on a hot stove, you won't do it again. You will tend to realize that that was a painful experience and you will learn from that experience. On the other hand, if you do something and it brings about a good result, it makes you feel better off, then you'll tend to do it again. Uh, you will respond to things that bring pleasure and benefit. Uh, and so the argument simply is that people learn from experience. To not learn from experience is actually not rational. Another principle is that people discount the future. In other words, we tend to value future benefits uh, less than current benefits. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, as the old saying has it. Again, this is rational because the future is radically uncertain. Human beings, despite what many of them say, cannot predict the future. Uh, the future is uncertain in a way that the present and the past are not. And therefore, a benefit that you may be getting a year from now should always be valued less than a benefit that you can get uh, in the here and now or more in more close time, a benefit you're going to get tomorrow, for example. The, the final sort of abstract point is that human beings have what are called transitive preferences. What that means is that if you prefer A to B and you prefer B to C, you also prefer A to C. So if you prefer apples to bananas and you prefer bananas to chocolate, you also prefer apples to chocolate. Uh, the reason why that is rational is because if you don't have transitive preferences, you can be stuck in a perpetual decision-making loop where you go round and round in circles because confronted with the choice between apples and bananas, uh, you'll prefer apples, uh, then presented with the choice between apples and chocolate, uh, maybe this time you actually prefer chocolate, so you choose chocolate, but then you have the choice between chocolate and bananas, and this time you choose bananas, and so you end up going round and round in circles, which is not a productive way of arriving at a decision. In fact, you don't arrive at a decision. So you have transitive preferences. So it, to say that people are rational choosers simply means that those three principles apply. You act to maximize utility, defined as having more of what you want, less of what you don't want. You learn from experience and you have transitive preferences. Now, it is worth saying that what economists very often say also is that as a heuristic, people will tend to act to maximize their material well-being. In other words, that utility maximization will typically mean, in most cases, that people will act to maximize their material well-being. It's a qualification of the first principle. But that is simply a heuristic. It's not an essential or necessary part of rational choice. It's an observation made from looking at how people have actually cho chosen in the past. You can understand this, perhaps, through the idea of the hierarchy of needs developed by the psychologist Abraham Maslow, which says that typically people will act first to satisfy material needs, such as food, housing, clothing and the like. Once those are satisfied, they will then tend to act, uh, act to maximise higher needs, uh, such as cultural enjoyment, for example. So there's a hierarchy of different levels of need. So saying that people will tend to act to maximize material needs doesn't necessarily mean that they're not concerned uh, with other things as well. Now, what this means is that people will behave in broadly predictable ways in the aggregate. In other words, if you say that people are rational choosers, what you can say is that Although there will be individuals whose behavior will be highly unpredictable or off the charts, when you look at people in the aggregate, in the mass, you can say that they will act and behave in a broadly predictable way. This means you can explain or use incentives and the way people respond to them 
to explain how they will behave in large numbers, which is a crucial part of economics, of course. Now, what about behavioural economics? Uh, many people today have said that uh, behavioural economics, the kind of work of people like a, uh, Tversky and others, shows that uh, rational choice theory is simply wrong. It just does not work. That is not how human beings choose. Actually, this is not the case. What uh, behavioural economics should be understood as is as a qualification of rational choice theory. Uh, in other words, what it's saying is that yes, people are rational choosers, but you have to qualify that because we also have all these cognitive biases that have been identified, which means that the way we exercise rational choice is influenced or affected in various ways by the kind of hard wiring that we have as a species, for example, to be excessively optimistic. It's not a refutation of uh, rational choice, behavioural economics, because so far, behavioural economics has not come up with an alternative general theory of action. And so what we should think of behavioural economics as being as a series of qualifications to the general principle of rational choice. But if you're an economist, you really do have to assume that still, even allowing for all those qualifications that behavioural economics has introduced, we are still dealing with rational choosers when we're talking about human beings.